Thank you, uh, everyone. So I'm Jeremy Wilcox uh, from uh, the Guides Association of New York City, and I'm going to now turn it over to uh, one of my fellow board members, John Simlack, who is uh, going to take us on a journey to New Jersey, uh, the, uh, the sixth borough of New York City. Take it away, John. Well, yeah, New Jersey via Moscow, but yes, thank you, Jeremy, and welcome everybody, and thanks for attending another one of our uh, our sessions, uh, New York City Remembers, and I, I really think this is an opportunity for uh, us tour guides to tell the stories that New York has to tell. And of course, uh, we're telling stories about an event that we kind of burned in our memory uh, very much, uh, the, the attacks on September 11th, which happened 20 years ago. This Saturday, is that right? That's the, the, the day. Um, most of you know me, but I'll just introduce myself formally. I'm John Semlack. Uh, and aside from being a specialist on historical topics like Abraham Lincoln and a, a few other things, the history of baseball in New York and things like that, and some other passions I have, uh, the other another aspect of my life is before I became a tour guide, I was living in Russia as an English teacher. I lived in Moscow for 15 years. Um, and I do have quite an interest in, in Russian connections to New York and Russian topics. And so when we were, you know, calling on Gannick members to tell a story about 9-11, you know, my story was, was that I was around on the other side of the globe when it happened. Um, and I tried to figure out a way to tell that story. And so that's what I'm going to do here. And we're gonna, I'm going to focus, uh, I'm gonna, during this presentation, um, as, and I'm going to go to the share, my, oh, oh yeah, I have share screen enabled, that's good, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to start my presentation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal experiences, how I uh, experienced September 11th, 2001. And I'm, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Russian reaction, which ultimately is a gift from the Russian people, this monument you see on the right, which is located in Bayonne, New Jersey, known as the Teardrop Memorial, also known as the Tear of grief and has a few other names as well. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the sculptor of this monument, a Russian Georgian sculptor, Zurat Zeretelli, who is uh, by Georgian in the uh, uh, re reference to the Republic of Georgia. Uh, so uh, that I hope that this is an appropriate way to remember September 11th. I do just want to add a caveat. The, um, to this program, because my program is probably going to be a little bit different in tone than some of our other excellent programs for New York City Remember. I, I, you know, I obviously did not have a personal experience seeing this up close. Uh, you know, I've attended so many presentations during uh, the, our, our, our uh, program here for the Guys Association of New York City, and some of them have just been so moving, and I've seen presenters uh, get so emotional that they literally break down during their talks. And, and, and it's just uh, uh, really incredible to witness uh, the power of the event. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I obviously have a much more distant point of view on all of that. But also, the memorial that we're going to talk about, the uh, the teardrop memorial, which I'm going to refer to it as, you know, this memorial doesn't have a nice and deep story uh, that you know we would love to be able to tell. It, it is, um, it, you know, it is. It, it, it first of all was rejected by the first city it was presented to, which is a common theme in Saratelli's work, unfortunately. Uh, it is. It, it has been called a number of names. It's been called a tea biscuit. Uh, it has been called, I want to get, I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, just go out of present mode. I'm going to get the text right here. It was called, pardon me, I don't have this written down. Uh, it was called an insensitive self-aggrandizing piece of pompousness by one of the world's blatant self-promoters, referring to the artist. So, um, uh, you know, and also one of the 9-11 Survivor, pardon me. Sorry, going all over the place here. With this. this is very bad. Pardon me. Uh, it was um, 
it was called it was compared by one of the survivors of, of the uh, 9 11 attacks it, it was compared to a sexual organ i'm not going to read the exact words and i wouldn't have even mentioned that at all but since it was the actual words of a survivor i thought it deserved at least a little respect so uh, this monument has a lot of controversy attached to it and um uh Okay, um, there's some background noise going on. Is that is that correct? Uh, Jeremy, do you, is there any background noise on your end? I'm not currently uh, hearing any. If anyone else is still hearing um, any background noise, please let me know. Might have just been a temporary glitch. Okay, I will. Um, I, I just turned off a fan that was right behind me. That I, so uh, maybe that'll have some impact. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in any case, that's uh, uh, that. That I just want to again start with that caveat that this presentation may not have quite the tone that some of our other wonderful presentations that have had this week. Okay, but going on, uh, and of course we continue to the World Trade Center. This is my photo, which I took on the Circle Line boat tour, and I think 1998, if I'm not mistaken, but around then. Uh, I think it was my, my wife's first visit. I, of course, my wife is Russian, and it was my wife's first visit to uh, the United States. And of course, we saw a lot of the New York City sites, and of course, the World Trade Center was very much part of our experience. So one of my good friends then worked near the World Trade Center, and he advised us. He gave us the local tip on where to shop, Century 21 Department Store, which of course just recently closed, but was right next door. So we spent a lot of time in the plaza between the towers, and it, it certainly was uh, a, a special place to us. But I was not in New York City when this happened. I was living in Moscow, uh, not traveling to New York. Uh, and of course, all of us can remember, or many of us can remember exactly where we were when we heard the news. Now, I was, I was an English teacher, and I was doing a lot of work teaching uh, in American or foreign companies in Russia that had their students learn English. And so during the day, and uh, the attacks happened in the late afternoon in Moscow, uh, the, several of my students had told me uh, news that they had seen the, of a plane hitting the World Trade Center. And of course I thought it was terrible. And, you know, I, I didn't think too much of it. I was you know, assuming I would read about it later on, but I, I didn't you know, think that it was the event that it was. And then another student, I believe, told me that a second plane did it. Now that obviously sounded worse, but I just didn't believe it. I don't think I, I, I believed that was possible. I, I assumed that somebody was mixing it up and they were they were had seen the same story twice or something like that. Uh, and I, I just couldn't believe that uh, it was the, somebody uh, uh, that that there there was such a problem. Uh, but in any case. Uh, I, I, I'm on my way home, and this is the apartment building where I was living at the time, where my wife and I were living at the time. And I remember exactly, my wife called me uh, walking up the street near, very near the building, and she told me that what had happened, she was, her voice was shaking, and she said that both of the towers had collapsed and were no more. So, um, of course, I immediately uh, went to, uh, to, into my apartment and logged online. We didn't, neither of us ever watched or did watch television news. And I could have turned on Russian television and seen reports of the attacks, but I, I, I went online. I listened to a lot of radio online then, but this was still dial up internet. So watching video online wasn't so easy. So I listened to a lot of NPR and actually a lot of BBC radio reports uh, about uh, the events and of course did reading online. I, I was spared of the constant repeats of the videos of the planes crashing in, which I guess, uh, I know that became a big uh, topic later on. But this is where I was uh, when it happened. Of course, we did return to New York City. And, uh, you know, like so many people, we went to the, uh, this was, it was still, uh, you know, you could only get as far as St. Paul's Chapel to see all the, you know, all of the memorials there and, and stuff like that. And, and so on. now, uh, of course, there was a response from Russia. Vladimir Putin was very quick to send condolences. Uh, here's the uh, front pages of a number of Russian newspapers uh, at the time, of course, showing huge pictures. There you see massive pictures of 
people one way, and there's a, of course, people from the left, there's George Bush, there's an English language daily that I was a regular reader of. They're up on the right by the school times. Um, this is uh, the front of one front page I could find on it of that day, the, of course, September 12th. This is Pravda. Now, Pravda was an old Soviet propaganda organ back in the day, but a lot of those types of news agencies had actually survived the, the fall of the Soviet Union and, and, and continued to exist in an era when, when you know, news was more independent in, in Russia. And they, you know, they, these were old brand names that you know, people still would read or, or watch. So of course, you know, there you see, I mean, this is like any newspaper. Well, obviously it's in Russian, but uh, you know, I'm sure people can understand what is being talked about there. Um, uh, Vladimir Putin, who had, was in his second year of his presidency then, uh, he had succeeded Boris Yeltsin, uh, um, and of course is still president now, and probably for the foreseeable future. Uh, but his his first lady uh, is no longer; they've separated. The woman on the, on the left, on the uh, right there, and now uh, there he is, obviously touring the site with Rudy Giuliani. We can recognize that. And this is actually in New York City. Uh, this is uh, Saint Nicholas Orthodox Church, which is on right, right, actually facing out whether it's 98th or 97th Street, uh, but it's in East Harlem. Uh, not far from me, and uh, it's a Russian Orthodox Church, St. Nicholas, uh, that is often attended by Russian officials, and uh, there is Vladimir uh, and his then wife in attendance with uh, some Orthodox officials there. So there, so this was uh, a short time after September 11th. Now, uh, in Moscow, though, the focal point for reactions is, of course, the American Embassy. This is the main building of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. It's a place I know very well. It was. Uh, where the, 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 the main building there, which is part of a, a larger complex, faces the street, and uh, that's where the consular section is, so where Russia did be, and where I got my daughter's birth certificate uh, when, after she was born. So uh, that this was this was often a place for protests. Of course, uh, only two years earlier, a very large protest against uh, the, uh, um, the war in Yugoslavia took place there. Uh, so this was this is not always a place of support, but after September 11th, there was a very, very different reaction. Of course, and here we see the massive amount of flowers. Muscovites came in thousands, bringing flowers and grieving with uh, Americans who they considered sort of fellow uh, humans in in the face of ter terrorism. There's this is uh, the, the text there reads that Americans, we are grieving for you. Uh, there, here's another photo of some, some people placing flowers down the country. And these are probably, this is actually an American grieving uh, outside the American embassy. Now, uh, I mean, Russians uh, have, uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, had experienced terrorism. And that was one of the things that many Russians felt was a, a way that they could help react to this. Uh, only two years there had been uh, bombings in Moscow that collapsed entire apartment buildings, killing uh, quite a few people. And, and terrorism, I mean, I, while it's not as the, uh, a huge issue now, as, you know, for many, many years, was a very live issue in, in Moscow uh, and, uh, and Russia in general. Uh, the, but uh, more deeply than that, I think one of the very significant parts of the Russian identity is the sense that the Russian nation has endured massive trauma, probably, particularly during the Second World War, when over 25 million Russians died. And, and so uh, Russians have a very strong sense that they know better than anyone else the trauma of a nation. Uh, it's, I'm not saying that it's unique than that, is that you know, other nations have experienced terrible trauma, but I, I think it is something that is very, very deep in the uh, Russian psychology. And so they they really felt that they could approach America and say, yes, we understand, you know, we've been through very you know, deep problems. And, you know, one, I remember the words of a taxi driver who once told me, oh, well, you guys haven't, you haven't experienced this before. You haven't had war. And so that yeah, may or may not be true, but that was a point of view that Russians felt that they had. Okay, now, um, one of the men who drove by the American embassy uh, during that time and saw people on flowers and the people weeping was the sculptor Zorab Sevetelli. And he was so moved by seeing the tears 
that he was moved to design this. Now, this is this is his uh, explanation. Um, uh, he he was moved to design the teardrop memorial uh, as a gift to American. Okay, so that's what the teardrop is meant to represent. Is what he saw outside the American Embassy after September 11th. So we're going to talk a little bit about Kudak Spinatelli now from this portion of the program, who he is, uh, this very prolific sculptor uh, that uh, is somewhat controversial uh, and uh, and so forth. Now, he, he is of Georgian descent, uh, that is to say the Republic of the Georgia, former Soviet Republic, but he, he, he also identifies very much as Russian nowadays and he lives in Russia. He's actually a very important figure in the Russian art world. He is the uh, he is the uh, the I say president, but I might be not quite off on the title of the Russian Arts Academy. So he's a powerful figure in Russian art. He has also got many commissions uh, uh, for public art projects over the years and is is quite wealthy. I mean, it's not generally known how what he is, but it's very clear just from you know his lifestyle and, and his, the way he works that he's he's very very wealthy from all the works he's done over the years. Uh, uh, okay, now one of his earlier uh, he actually uh, started doing you know, he had a very typical uh, artist education in the Soviet Union. I mean, again, he is is you know, he, he certainly did live most of his life in the Soviet Union, and he. Um, uh, and is still alive, by the way. Uh, he, he had an education as a sculptor, and he received many early commissions for, for various public projects in the Soviet Union, and also for embassies of the Soviet Union abroad. So that, that gave him an exposure to the outside world. Uh, he actually traveled to the United States, very unusual event for, the, for a Soviet citizen, in 1979 as a, re a Soviet representative at the, at the Special Olympics held at SUNY Brockport, so the campus of uh, a, in, in SUNY Brockport in New York State, upstate. I've, I've not been able to get to this location. It's quite uh, a, a way uh, upstate, a little further than I've ever gotten. So I've had to rely on some photos from the, the SUNY Brockport website. Um, and he designed two works of sculpture that are still there. Uh, this is a work uh, uh, about uh, the happiness of children around the world. I forget that. That's the Akaki uh, title. And here is another one uh, that also is on the campus of SUNY Brockway. And these two works are, are quite, you know, I think representative of the type of sculpture that you see from Saratelli in the later in his career. They're quite large. Uh, he always goes to a very large size. He often abandons any sense of proportion. We'll see more of that uh, later on. You know, the, the figures are often, you know, the, the, the size of the figures that are compared in his work are often because they don't make sense and so forth. Uh, here's one of his most famous works in Moscow. And, and his, if you live in Moscow or travel to Moscow, his work is everywhere. Uh, and he's had many, many decades of work there. Uh, this is a, one of his most famous works, which is also probably his most controversial, the statue of Peter the Great, which is on the Moscow River. Uh, there you can see uh, the, uh, uh, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in the background. That's not terribly far. The Kremlin you can sort of make out of the background, but it's a bit, it's a bit down to the now. Now, this statue is almost universally hated in Moscow. Uh, and I mean, I, now it has fans. I, we shouldn't say that nobody likes it, but uh, it is, uh, you know, I never met somebody who uh, liked it, who was from Moscow at least. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, again, it's typical of his works. You know, Peter the Great is like, you know, much larger than the boat he's supposedly commanding. Here's a closer up picture of that on, on the uh, central part of the work. Uh, and, and so forth. So, unfortunately. now this is actually quite similar to uh, another work that he did uh, called uh, The Birth of a New World. It's the statue of Christopher Columbus. Now, th th this work uh, is another typical story of works by Sinatelli, and that he created this in anticipation of the 500 year anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World. In four, in, so 1492, uh, it would have been 1992. And he assumed that an American city would buy this. And so he made it in advance. But several American cities rejected, including New York City. 
There was an idea. I have no idea how serious this goes. There was an idea to put this on Roosevelt Island. This is a massive sculpture, by the way. I, I mean, the trees, I hope, give you some sense of scale. Uh, it ended up being um, uh, installed in Puerto Rico in a very, very obscure location. I mean, I say obscure, it's just not in a, in a major city. Uh, and it's, you know, a little bit uncertain. I, mean, I think there's some plans to develop a kind of amusement park around it or something like that. But that hasn't come to fruition yet. Uh, he, he is a big fan of St. George. Uh, this is a work of his in a, uh, a park in Moscow called Victory Park, uh, it, which is honors uh, the Second World War. Uh, uh, Russians know it colloquially as Poklonland. And a statue of St. George slaying the dragon, or he's metaphorically slaying the Nazi German, but you can see a slot under there that uh, symbolizes that. Uh, and St. George is a huge uh, element of his work. Uh, nearby, there is a monument to the Holocaust. Uh, this is a work called Tragedy of Peoples. Uh, and uh, so he did touch on that subject uh, a bit. And of course, it was in a World War II monument, so that's part of it. This, of course, is in the, near the United Nations in New York City. Uh, this is the uh, good defeats evil is recorded as again St. George, a popular subject of this, uh, slaying a dragon. And the dragon is made of uh, metal from nuclear missiles, Soviet and American uh, nuclear missiles. So it's uh, you know, meant to be, of course, it's uh, sitting on the ground in the United Nations, but he's attempting to be very forward thinking in, it, in his sentiments there. Uh, this is a, yet another St. George, a very fun. This is a victory column. Or a independent column in Independence Square in Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, his native uh, country, which became independent during his life. Okay, so those are the the kinds of works that he uh, has had uh, over the years, and also the kind of stories, you know, that, that we get a sense of his style or the, his use of proportion, and we find and and also the controversies around it, and the fact that his his works are not, you know, always appreciated as much as he would like them to be appreciated. And so now we come to the Teardrop Memorial, in, uh, which, as I said, was finally placed in Bayonne, New Jersey. It was originally meant to be given to Jersey City. Uh, Serratelli's explanation was he felt that it was appropriate for a monument to be in New Jersey because this is where many of the victims were transported to, as you know, many people uh, who had to get away were uh, brought to New Jersey. So that was one of his interpretations uh, for that. Now, he, um, uh, there was a, a mayor of Jersey City named Glenn Cunningham, who was actually a supporter of this project and was on board with it. But he died, I think, in 2004. And the next mayors did not support this project. And so uh, Bayonne uh, seemed to be uh, willing to host it. And so it was placed near, and if you don't know where this is, this is on the end, the very end of the pier where the Bayonne cruise train is. It's a very, very out of the way location. Um, if you don't have a car, this is extremely difficult to get to. I actually went there uh, just a few days ago. But I'd never, I, I'd been there once on a tour for a pickup for a cruise. I think I'd actually been to that cruise train a few times, but I had only once gone up to the morning. But uh, still, it, it, was, it, it was very difficult to get to. Um, I, 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 you know, without public, without a car, and so I, I went there and took a bike and took a, took a path to New Jersey and so forth. And it's, it's a very, very arduous journey, though. Uh, but in any case, that's where it is, and it is a, once once you get there, it is very you can really appreciate uh, the, uh, the 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 monument itself. Now it's a hundred feet tall, very much in line with uh, his proportion. And the, the tier that you see inside is yes, made of stainless steel. It is 40 feet tall all by itself. I think I've got a close up of that. There you go. Um, so that, you know, that, that's just, just uh, I mean, I, you know, just, just astounding in, in size. It does, of course, face straight towards the World Trade Center. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see that. There are several uh, panels all around it that have the names of the victims, as you would expect. Now, uh, they're in alphabetical order. Uh, one unfortunate bit, though, is apparently Ceratelli 
use an outdated list of names. And there are over 3,000 names here. And as we know, that that's not the number of people who died on September 11th. He, I think he just didn't get the correct, you know, he wasn't very careful in his list. And, and, and there, so some of the names uh, are people who were later identified as not having been killed there. So that's a bit of a shame. Um, there is these pillars there uh, all honor the victims from Bayonne. Okay, each one of those. Honors. So it, it does, this does become, even though it honors all the victims that were loaded, the monument is meant to honor those who died in Bayonne. And there, there's a close up of that's what those. Right. One of the, the uh, Bayonne victims was, was killed on, uh, in 1993 in the, the bombing of the World Trade Center. Uh, in February 1993, and that, that, that one of these panels has the name of that victim there. Okay, uh, this is a plaque honoring the thing. You have the name of the sculptor, and uh, also the president who gave the monument to the people. You actually have the signature engraved there. So the uh, there, the text is all the same on uh, the English and the English on the other side. Uh, there, uh, and. Uh, the, the monument does have to the side a piece of steel from the World Trade Center, the original Twin Towers. It's typical of the monuments to the thing. Now, there's a couple of interesting little details uh, to this. The, 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 the monument has 11 sides where the panels of names are, and there are nine paths. That lead up. I don't have. A, I don't know that I have a picture that illustrates those paths very well. But there are nine curved paths that lead up to the monument, and that is meant to be nine to eleven. So again, there's a little bit of. It's interesting. I mean, you see a lot of those. That kind of symbology in the uh, uh, at the Royal Trades, the uh, Nunwood Memorial itself as well. Okay. Now, of course, there are are very good views of the World Trade Center from there, and then there's this other plaque again. Um, giving honor to the sculptor and to uh, the Russian president. Um, the uh, uh, and of course, as as usual, the uh, monument faces straight towards the World Trade Center. Uh, the um, um, uh, the uh, Vladimir Putin did attend a groundbreaking ceremony in 2005 to uh, to open this, but it was that was not the dedication. It was a groundbreaking ceremony. In 2006, the monument was formally dedicated, and the uh, uh, former President Bill Clinton attended that ceremony among other officials. Okay, and that that is the Teardrop Memorial. Uh, it is also known as a monument to the struggle against world terrorism. So it has uh, yes, uh, the, the name is the uh, left there. The, I think this is the fact that um, honored the Putin's dedication ceremony, I should say. And here's a closer up version of the illustration there, which I think is quite nice, actually. You can see those curving paths, which actually are there. Uh, and you know, of course, he very much intended the Statue of Liberty to be in the background as, of course, the site of the former site of. The Twin Towers is very typical. Of, you know, of course, uh, the various memorials too. Sometimes they typically face uh, the site of the Twin Towers. Okay. It is a beautiful site, um, and I do, you know, I I would probably say it's best visited by car. Um, you know, I would, you know, I would not repeat the the journey there without that. Again, maybe a zip car makes more sense. They spend so much money on various paths. I used to the um, even with a bicycle, I did do part of the journey on the New Jersey light rail system um, because I it was just doing, doing the whole thing by bike was a little bit too much for me uh, in the current shape on it. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I think it is worth. It's a nice place where there aren't too many people there, um, so I do recommend if you are in, in on the Jersey side to, to give it a, a, a visit. I think it does. It certainly is a monument respectful of the events that we've experienced uh, that we experienced 20 years ago. And that's my presentation. I wasn't uh, too long, and I hope that um, uh, everybody enjoyed it. I hope that the, this whatever sound bump we had isn't too bothersome. I'm just going to check the uh, Q and A. Uh, what are the gray sculptures made of? Um, uh, I um, let's see. I'm 
you know, let's see, what? I, I, I'm going to say I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not sure which, are we talking about the, are we talking about, I'm going to have to ask for a follow-up question there, which sculpture, and Emma is here, and she's going to answer that. Um, uh, I do appreciate Karen uh, saying that the pictures are authentic. I should say that if it's, some of these photos are not photos that I normally use for presentation like this, since this is a volunteer effort. I was a little more liberal because um, I borrowed some photos from so you know, not proprietary sites like you know, uh, the, you know, news sources and so forth. But I did, wherever possible, use my own photos or, or at the very least, uh, um, um, public domain photographs. I did. I did actually go to Georgia to to, to uh, see uh, this, for example. DC, uh, uh, was it two years ago now, uh, for the world, uh, the uh, World Federation Convention. So, but uh, yeah, now I forced to do this presentation. I had to do uh, to take advantage of it. In Russia, they are not just they look like the CFP. Really great. Okay, I um, I'm gonna thank you very much for clarifying that. If somebody can answer that better than me, here, um, uh, I would love to. Yeah, I think did did um. But uh, I uh, I can't say why how a certain sculpture. I mean, sculptures do manage to spread. I mean, I I assume that it does require maintenance and so forth. Uh, but it is a it's a question. I mean, these his works are massive, so obviously that increases the maintenance difficulties. Uh, but, and that's not you know, I'm sure an issue. Uh, and I think it will be an issue in the coming in in you know like if not now maybe 20 years from now or 40 years from now. It was the, the the Peter the Great statue was dedicated in 1997. I believe it was meant to commemorate that. Russians love commemorating anniversaries, and it's a huge thing there. Even if the anniversaries aren't particularly even years, they'll they'll do something. Like that. The, there's an old joke, you know, you'll celebrate the the first day of the week or the second day of the week. It's any day for any excuse to have a drink. Um, and uh, I, I think it was the commemoration of the birth of the Russian fleet. But other than that, uh, I uh, does anybody else have any questions? So glad that some, uh, some of the people attended. Um, any sculpture in Russia you know of which was designed by an American? Um, I think yes. I don't have a picture handy, but um, the, there is a statue. Uh, oh, I see why. And the guest comes always is appearing here because it's okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, Emma is always with us in presentations because she is our host. She, she, um, uh, the um, uh, there is a statue of Walt Whitman in Moscow. I've posted it on my Facebook feed. I will, uh, um, Jim, since you asked this question and you and I are friends, I'll tag you. On that photo because I have it on Facebook uh, to see if you can do it later on. Uh, so there is a statue by Walt Whitman, which was, um, I assume it was bit, done by an American, but it might have been done by a Russian. Uh, there are, are not a lot of Russian American cult, like artistic connections. You know, there are very few statues of Russians in America. There's a stat, we know that there's a statue of Lenin in. In, in New York, but that's because it was kind of stolen by some sort of you know left leaning American and brought here. Um, it, 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 uh, there was an exchange where a statue of Pushkin was dedicated in Washington, D.C. Jim, I'm sure you may know where that is. I've looked that up, but I don't have the, uh, the, the info on the tip of my tongue now. Uh, and uh, in, in exchange to that, a statue of Walt Whitman was dedicated outside of Moscow State University. I've taken a picture of that um, before, and like I said, I'll, I'll tag you on that. But uh, uh, the, I think that was the designed by an American, but I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously the Cold War politics made us so good. There are a couple of busts of Americans also at the um, the Moscow International Library. I think well, something like that. There's a library of, of foreign, no, the Library of Foreign Literature is what it's called. Um, 
and there's a bust of Lincoln, which I believe was donated by the University of Illinois. Again, I've, I've taken pictures of that. I'll, I'll, I'll post those online and, and tag you. Um, so I, those, that's what little I can remember. There's been a few other uh, uh, connections, Russian American connections, but there aren't too many, unfortunately. And again, but, uh, Serdatelli has actually offered to, to just do a statue of Roosevelt and have it installed in America. That's been re rejected. <laughs> There's not a lot of interest in more of Serdatelli's work, unfortunately. Uh, otherwise, if there are any more questions, I think we can finish up. Um, so I hope uh, people have enjoyed this and um, uh, appreciated this. And yes, thank you so much for the appreciation. And Jeremy, I think uh, I'm going to hand this back to you. I'm going to stop the share. Sure. And Jeremy, I'll hand this over to you. All right. So I want to thank uh, the folks who uh, showed up to uh, attend this and for your great questions and your great feedback. Um, obviously, we really appreciate everyone's support of Gannix NYC Remembers Initiative. So if you are interested in attending other virtual programming that we're going to be doing, um, just double checking here our schedule. So we have two more uh, on Friday, the, uh, the 10th at 2 p.m. Uh, we have one on the original World Trade Center, the architecture and planning uh, by the very talented and amazing Anthony Robbins, um, who certainly knows his architecture. You can register on our site for that. And then our final one will be on Sunday afternoon, the 12th at 2 p.m. Um, Karen will be doing an encore of her look at how Broadway and the Broadway industry responded to the September 11th attacks. Um, and that's kind of a unique look at the aftermath of that. So uh, please sign up for those if you are uh, interested. Uh, the links for the Zooms are on our website. Um, and yeah, and we've got uh, two more walking tours coming up. Um, one tomorrow, uh, sorry, yes, tomorrow morning um, in Lower Manhattan and one on Sunday, uh, which will be in Staten Island, uh, which I think will be very enjoyable. So you can sign up on our website for those as well. All of these events are obviously totally open to the public. Um, so if you know anyone who would be interested, please share the, uh, the info. Um, but otherwise, thank you guys for joining. We hope we will see you on another event very soon. Um, and have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Bye, everybody.